asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. Massive interest in this since I mentioned today that uh, Sharon was coming on the programme. Got in touch with me um, late last year. I was speaking to... Um, I had a guest on who was speaking about forced adoption and the family courts. Um, Sharon introduced herself to me at the time and connected to me on Facebook. And at that stage, I didn't, I wasn't aware of and didn't realise that Sharon and her ex-husband had been the focus of the national media back in 2001. I didn't know, I didn't know that. Right, I, I had no idea and... Uh, it was, it, was, it, was, it was kind of a shock to me um, earlier this year when I realised who, in fact, it was that I was um, actually speaking with. So we had a good chat uh, last week and it was at that stage that she sent me a deluge of documents. Before we say a quick hello to her, just to remind you, back in 2001, so we're talking 17 years ago now, Sharon's 10-week-old daughter, Charlotte, became very, very ill and died shortly after being discharged from hospital a second time where she had been treated. And then, subsequently, Sharon's husband, Mark, then-husband Mark, was accused of murdering Charlotte. It was, it was alleged that after she had been discharged from hospital that Mark had beaten her. Um, he didn't. The trial was covered by the national media. I mentioned this earlier on. All the newspapers, all the radio stations, it was huge at the time. Um, the first trial collapsed, if memory serves, from my notes today. Um, there was a subsequent retrial and then Mark was acquitted, quite rightly. He had nothing to do with Charlotte's death. This is, this is obvious. It was obvious to the court. It's obvious now. So she was determined to find out what had happened then. Why did she get so ill so quickly, baby Charlotte? And Sharon began to investigate. And by doing that, by starting that process, well, what she's uncovered since then and the consequences that she's, I suppose, suffered since then are remarkable. Let's welcome her to the programme. Sharon, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good. I'm good, thank you. Thanks for coming on. Um, we won't pretend that this is the first time we've spoken. We've had a few chats and uh, I've, um, I've been mentioning already that there aren't too many people who have a story like yours. I've heard some, some, some tough and some difficult things over the years, but there aren't too many people like you who've handed me basically a deluge of documents which go beyond endorsing what it is that you're saying. Prove categorically what what it is that you're saying. And we'll come to the bits and pieces that you sent me, the documents you've collected. We're going to start, I, I think we, you and I spoke earlier, we'll do this in three parts. We'll talk about what happened to Charlotte. We'll talk about the aftermath of the trial, what you were doing, what you were looking into, and how that led up to you leaving the country. And then we'll talk about you coming back into the country. So we'll do it in three parts. Talk to us about Charlotte. Um... Charlotte was born in 2001. Don't know what it's like. I imagine it's amazing. Beautiful, yeah, beautiful mean, child. Go at, ahead. At, at that time, um, I had a son from a um, previous relationship and, and my ex, well, now ex-husband, he had two boys as well. Um, so when everyone was around, obviously, I was massively outnumbered. Even the dog was a boy. So to get <laughs> this little girl to that kind of made everyone related overnight. You know, we couldn't have been more made up. Um, we we'd recently um, moved house, um, and um, so Charlotte was born, and and the day after we had, I think it was um, one my um, ex husband's son's birthday party. So literally, she was born the day before, um, and a garden full of kids, and life was normal, you know. Um, but pff, no one could have envisaged what possibly was going to be just around the corner and it's it makes you wish you'd appreciated it all more because it changed so quickly um so charlotte came along um it was by pure chance um she ended up having a 
vaccinations one day um, we, because we'd moved house. The card hadn't come through, you know, for the old baby stabbing clinic, clinic to go and get these immunizations done. Um, so I just basically basically taken her to the clinic to get her weighed because we'd had this house move and and I hadn't had her weighed for a couple of weeks so I'd, I'd just taken her down there get her weighed to check that everything was okay and they were like oh you're the you're she's here to have her immunizations done I was like oh hang on I didn't know about that um before I knew it she was gone the immunizations were done and that, that that was that she it went from having a weight to just being absolutely you know bombarded you couldn't you I couldn't have got her out of that place without them being done <laughs> you know the mid what the health visitor was there the nurses are there the GPs are there um all the other mothers are staring at you if you kick up a stink because I was like I don't want her having the MMR um, that was the only, at that time, only immunisation I had an issue with. Um, they they gave her the MMR anyway, even though I said not to. Um, didn't find that out until obviously all her medical records came up. So they gave her the DTP and the MMR job in the same day? They gave her the DTAP, um, dip, which is diphtheria, tetanus and produce, which of whooping cough. They gave her the meningitis and they also gave her the polio, oral polio. She was only a few weeks old now, right? Um, she she was just turned eight weeks, but she was, I mean, they shouldn't have immunised her anyway because from her last time that she'd been weighed, she had lost weight. Um, a counterindicator, even on their own miserable list of things in the packet, if a child's not thriving, you don't you don't immunise them. Well, that, that, that happened. Um, so life goes on. Within... Two days, she was so ill. She wouldn't feed. She was just inconsolable, you know, inconsolable. Um, you couldn't put her down. Um, she would stop crying if she was on you, but obviously wasn't thriving. Um, I took her down to the doctors after about two days, and, and he was like, well, no, she's all right. Give her a Um She'll rally round. About another day later, still no improvement. And it's like, no, I'm not having this. Took her back again, got fobbed off again. Um, in the end, I had to go to work that afternoon. Um, my my ex-husband and I, we had a company at that stage. And he was at home with Charlotte. And I had to go. I can't even remember where I had to go now. Must have been a client that, you know, was one of mine. Yeah. Um, he, I got a call saying um, I'm taking Charlotte to the hospital because I've taken her down the doctors again and the doctors now referred her to Winchester Hospital. So that was down tools, straight in the car, down the hospital. Now this went on, on and off for uh, a week. She'd be in there a couple of days, they'd discharge her. She was still losing weight, she still wasn't feeding. I'd take her back, they'd keep her overnight again or two nights, discharge her. And the last time that they discharged her, um, um, I had all my family, like my mother and my sister, down, and we had a house full of children, as usual. Um, and I was cooking dinner for everybody. Um, so she'd been discharged the day before, but we were told we had to go and see the doctor the Sunday morning. Um, so, so my ex-husband, he, he took her, um, saw the same doctor that we'd seen a number of times. Yep, everything's fine. Absolutely nothing wrong with her. Um, by lunchtime, so he would have got home, I think, about 11.30, approximately 11.30. Um, by lunchtime, I was trying to resuscitate my daughter upstairs. It was in, It was like they didn't, it was like they knew what was going on and they didn't want it to happen in their hospital. I could be wrong, but <laughs> that was, that's how I feel about that. Um, she was kept in. On the 26th of November, admitted by a physician, she was discharged on the 29th, but her condition was getting worse. And I've seen this in the documents. And she was readmitted, yeah. as you described there with, with, um, with Mark, she was readmitted on the 30th. But then a couple of days later, she was released again. Yeah. And when she was released again, this is the day that it got really bad. 
these are her last days, effectively. And when yeah, I, I mean, she she died at our house. Um, the the ambulance. Um, there was a first responder, like just a doctor. Literally, he was leaping up them stairs four at a time. Um, and then the ambulance came. We went to the hospital, but she died in the ambulance. They managed to bring her back. Well, but they didn't really. Um, they they got a very faint heartbeat. She never did breathe independently for herself or anything. She she you know she was gone in all intents and purposes. Um, so we went down to the obviously in the ambulance down to the hospital, the one that she'd only been in a few hours before, kind of thing. Um, we were in in the um, emergency department. This is that There's- Great Ormond Street Hospital, now, is it? No, this is Winchester Hospital. This is still Hospital. Winchester. She was, okay. Yeah, she was first taken to Winchester Hospital um, where they performed um, a number of tests. Um, the doctors weren't there. It was a Sunday, so they were calling doctors from goodness knows where. So there was massive delays in her health care at Winchester Hospital. Um, and she, there she had um, an um, MMR, um, MR. I'm all right. right. Sorry, oh, you're fine. <laughs> I'm rambling. Um, she a uh, brain scan and a CT scan. Um, with that, um, I I was like an outside trying to catch my breath because this I think this was my first experience of a panic attack at that stage. So I went outside. I came back in um, and I heard this doctor who discharged her that morning, who discharged, who discharged her a number of times, it wasn't just that morning, um, telling me that I was a bit neurotic um, and there was nothing wrong. And I heard him talking to the guy who'd done like in neurology saying, fucking hell, fucking hell, someone's going to lose their fucking job over this. I thought I was in such shock. I was like, did I just hear that? Yeah. And But everything was moving like 100 miles an hour. Then she gets transferred to Great Ormond Street. Um, so we follow her up to Great Ormond Street. Um, and there, basically, no one thought she was going to get better. No one was telling us anything. Um, it had turned into a police investigation, and and that was that. And once that started... No other cause was looked for. It was child abuse. It Sharon, was who called the police? Who got Sorry? the police involved? Um, the hospital. Right. Unknown to you and Mark, somebody in the hospital contacted the police. Yeah. Um, at this stage, um, like because now a number of hours have passed, it's like the middle of the night now down at Great Ormond Street. Um, I didn't know this at the time, but during this time, because my mother and my sister are at the house, the house had been turned into a crime scene. They were put up in a hotel and had been interrogated already by the police. Now, we knew none of this, none of this. Um, so that that was how quickly that was going to be the cause of Charlotte's death. We, no one knew at that stage what the cause of Charlotte's death were. Um <clears throat> and from there, obviously, it just got worse and worse. A couple of days after being in Great Ormond Street, life support was turned off. Um, and basically, we were both arrested, um, kept in the police station for a couple of nights. Um, thousands and thousands of pages of, of transcripts, um, of interviews and stuff like that. Um, they And in the end, they let me out, um, not on bail or anything. I was just, that's it, get out, off you go. Um and and um You were interrogated, mind. Sharon, while while you're trying to come to terms with the unimaginable, and it is unimaginable for people who've never been through it, while you're trying to deal with that, you're being interrogated by detectives. Yeah, and who believe up. who believe that you might be responsible for the death of Charlotte. How did you cope yeah. with that? How did you deal with that? Um, well to be honest, um I was relatively like calm. Um, because a you can't believe what's happened. Nothing sunk in at that stage. Um, like I wasn't going off at the police or anything like that. But there was a dirty game that was playing there. Um, when when obviously m- m- my ex husband and I spoke about this after. Um, there was points in the interview where they were going into him and saying, "Oh, actually, there's um, it's now questionable over paternity." Yeah. 
And he's like, fuck off. Don't even try that bollocks. So it was really filthy from the beginning. Um, and they, I, they'd they made their mind up it was him. So in reality, I think they were just going through the motions with me. But, I mean, we were there. I think I, think I, I was only in there one night one day one night and then the following day and I think I got let out probably about seven eight o'clock that two days later kind of thing um but they'd made their mind up it was him um and the only reason that they made their mind up that it was him was because he happened to be the one upstairs feeding her if it had been the other way around and I hadn't been cooking you know a Sunday lunch for everybody if it had been the other way around it would have been me up there feeding her and I would have got charged there was no rocket science to this it was like well you had a last you done it I just and, wanna, and that, yeah. that was that you know I just want to mention at this stage it's important there's there's a wee bit of an echo there but I think we'll we'll soldier on through it anyway because you you sound brilliant we can hear you perfect uh, Sharon I just want to mention at this point that and I'll throw these little nuggets in and this is all from the documentation that Sharon has given me and and it's not horror documentation by the way these are official documents let me just tell you that the nurses who cared for um Charlotte at Great Ormond Street Hospital where she eventually died they said there wasn't a mark on the child there wasn't a scratch there wasn't a bruise and when they were bathing her there was no tenderness there was no soreness this is a baby that hadn't been physically abused by anybody. It's very important to say that. She'd been desperately sick for a few days, getting worse and worse and worse, and being discharged inexplicably from a hospital until her condition got so bad that she was taken back to Winchester Hospital that day, then sent on to Great Ormer Street Hospital. But the police only had to look at what had been happening over the previous days. Right, I wanted to make that point, Sharon, about the nurses. All the information was there for the police. You, you know, you didn't have to be a very good police officer to realise that there was no concern about the parents or the welfare of the child in the home. There was none at all. This was just madness. And it escalated, yeah. it escalated then to, to a murder charge, effectively, didn't it? Instantly. Um, instantly. There was no... He was not going to be bailed pending further questioning. That was never going to be an option. Um, he was going to be in that magistrate on the Monday and then he was going to get transferred out of the magistrate straight away into Crown Court and bang, there you go. No bail. Um, and, 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 and no investigation at this stage. They hadn't even had the full toxicology, any toxicology screening done. They'd had no nothing. It would have been impossible on the day that they charged him that any of that medical information could have possibly possibly been there. And you, it wasn't. you need you need to educate our listeners here because this is really important. Because when I heard this and you're telling me this for the first time, I'm thinking, right, God love her, Charlotte. She's 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 passed away. There's bound to be uh, a pathologist. There's bound to be an autopsy. What happened with that? I mean, I, I, we might just—we're not going to lose track of where we are now. But we, we, we might j jump backwards and forwards between one and between one or two things between Mark getting charged in the court case. But of course, she had to be examined posthumously. When did that yeah. happen? Um, well, they were taking they were taking skin samples and blood samples and all sorts of things at Great Ormond Street, and I got actually really quite cross about this because it was absolutely obvious to everybody that she was not going to wake up, she was not going to breathe, life support was going to be turned off, and I was like, leave her alone, leave her alone, treat her like a lab rat. We know what the outcome of this is. You've already told us what the outcome of this is, so just stop. And no, it carried on and it carried on. Um, with with regards to the pathology, um, I well, I don't know when, who, first, second, what what pathology was done. But at the time that he was charged, absolutely nothing had been done, nothing, um, apart from some superficial kind of early blood test results that would have come from her previous blood results uh, that were taken at Winchester when she was in there before, before she'd collapsed, and whatever was at Great Ormond Street. But this was over which this was on a Monday and a Tuesday that because she'd collapsed on the Sunday by the time she was at Great Ormond Street it was Sunday night 
nothing could have possibly come back in the time to Tuesday night when when my my husband got charged. Nothing. No no pathologist had looked at her. Nobody had looked at her. They had charged him, and they didn't have they didn't have the the go ahead or the the authorization from a pathologist to say yes, we believe the child was murdered. What about what about a death certificate? Well, I heard, we only got, I only managed to get the death certificate, um, oh, when would that have been? I think 2012. Yeah. Um, it actually took going up to Westminster and jumping up and down. I'd burnt through a number of MPs that, you know, wouldn't touch this with a barge pole. Um, and then I did find an MP who would push for this death certificate. And the only reason we got that death certificate was because he was going to put it to Prime Minister's questions. In which case, that was never going to be allowed. That question was never going to be allowed to come out loud. Um, when I did get this death certificate, it's a complete fabrication. They don't even have my name right on it. It, it states that, um, like this death certificate was issued in in the January, um, the after the December that she had died. Two thousand and two. Well, that, that, that's not the case because it took me t- over two years to fight the CPS and the police to even allow me to bury her. When we did bury her, I had to, uh, the only way that I could do this um, to get her buried was by getting an interim death certificate. And the reason that I could only get an interim death certificate at that stage was because no inquest had been held and there was no outcome of the trial. So there was no cause of death. Which is unprecedented. Well, there's a cause of death now on this document that turns up all these years later that's supposed to have been issued in the, the following January. Absolutely couldn't have been. No pathology had been done. When this death certificate was issued, the pathology reports hadn't even come back. Sum up, sum up Mark's... Tr- I'm just going to... While, while I'm doing this, because of the echo, I'm just going to put your mic down just for a minute. Sum up the trial the accusations that were made by Mark. I know there was two trials. There was a collapse of a trial and then there was a uh, a subsequent second trial and Mark was acquitted. Sum up that and that's when we, we that's when you get to, to, to understand about the coroner, um, the person responsible for the autopsy of Charlotte. This is really important that we pay attention to this. The trial, Sharon, go ahead. What, what happened what? at trial? There, there wasn't uh, any retrial. Um, I couldn't have explained that properly. Probably my fault for jumping all over all over the show. Um, what happened was, I mean, this this went on three years, um, over three years, I think. Um, it, what happened was they had actually started and stopped four trials. Um, because I was turning into like Jessica Fletcher at this stage. I'm finding medical experts. I'm not accepting what's going on. And I'm on, I've, I've established that there is nothing in this trial that's going to happen. That's going to find out what, what happened to my daughter because it's an adversarial system and no one cares about the truth. It's just about winning. Doesn't matter what the aftermath of that is or the legacy it leaves. Doesn't matter. Um, so these trials started and stopped. The final trial, um, they let that run for six weeks. So six weeks, I was going around swapping cars so the, the press weren't chasing me. And, you, you know, I, I think I had more disguises than Salman Rushdie around that time. <laughs> um, and um, so the the judge basically sent the jury away one Friday, let them go early on a Friday, which hadn't seemed that unusual because he'd done it a few more times for his benefit, I think, more than anyone else's. And then um, on the Monday, and this is how much the police just love a prosecution witness. There I was, their star witness, not. And um, I'm driving in my car. I get a phone call on hands free, answer it. It's my family liaison officer. And he goes, you need to get to Winchester Court. Um, The judge has um, done no case to answer. It's all over. Well, I nearly bumped up the curb and drove into a lamppost. He didn't even tell me to pull over. He just dropped it like that. And that was and there was no explanation. No, nothing. And the reason that I think 
he just did not want to put that to the jury. I don't know why he didn't want to put it to the jury, because I felt sorry to, for the jury. Six weeks of seeing baby autopsy pictures and really things that unless you're medical, you never would get out of your head again. And he didn't value that jury enough to even put it to them. And to that, to this day, that's a mystery because there was no reason, no reason for it. Who's Alan Anscombe? He, he, he would, of course, he would have been present at the, uh, at the trial. He, he was, gave evidence at the trial. He gave Anscombe, evidence at the trial. Anscombe, yeah, Anscombe was um, the, the pathologist, apparently. Turns out probably wasn't. Um, or he most certainly wasn't the first pathologist, as those doctors, uh, as those those um, documents that I gave you show. Yeah. Um, because it turns out it was somebody else, no reporters ever. But he stood on there in that trial, gave a day and a half's worth of evidence, um, proclaiming that he was the only pathologist to have carried out that autopsy. Then the documents come in all those years later. I oh, know it was somebody else. So I've, whether the judge actually found any of this out, and that's why it didn't go to trial, didn't go to the jury, because I think if it had gone to the jury, he probably, like everybody else in these cases, would have been found guilty and would go through the appeal process. Um, but for him not to put that to the jury after letting them suffer what they did suffer, and they did, I saw some of their faces. There, there was women there who were well just as white as a sheet six weeks of that was horrific for them um and and so maybe that the reason that it didn't go to the jury so we couldn't be judged by peers was because maybe the judge did find out and that's and that's why he wanted this out of his court as quickly as possible let me do a very quick recap it's exactly 16 minutes to the top of the hour this is um, incredibly important stuff, what you're hearing now and what you're going to hear in the next few minutes. Sharon Gale is live on the line um, from the South Coast. Now, back in 2001, Sharon's 10-week-old daughter became seriously unwell shortly after receiving uh, a round of vaccinations for MMR and DTAP and meningitis. It became very seriously ill. In fact, she had a couple or three stays in hospital and was discharged despite the fact that she was obviously getting worse each time. Dreadful condition, weight loss, not eating, condition deteriorating up to the point where um, she died. And she died, um, she was rushed back to, to hospital. This would be on the uh, 30th of November, the 1st of December. Sharon can clarify that in a minute. Um back to Winchester Hospital. From there she was taken to Great Ormond Street Hospital. Her condition was absolutely dreadful. Before going to Great Ormond Street Hospital, Sharon overheard the physician who had discharged her several times, basically saying, somebody's going to get fucking fired uh, over this. When they went to Great Ormond Street Hospital, um, they noticed that the police were involved, the police had been called, they... The, the life support machine had been switched off for baby Charlotte. Her condition had got so bad that she wasn't able to make a recovery. In the meantime, Sharon and her then-husband Mark were questioned by the police. The police were determined to basically fit Mark up the uh, the, the child's father for her illness, for her, for her death, despite the fact that there was absolutely no evidence um, whatsoever that he or anybody else had been uh, abusing her mentioned the fact that the nurses at Great Ormond Street Hospital went on the record to say the child wasn't damaged physically in any way, wasn't tender, didn't react to being touched, um, wasn't sore uh, at all like that. Obviously gravely ill but hadn't been beaten. So we're talking about the trial now. Um, as Sharon said, it was stopped and started several times and eventually uh, the judge effectively stopped the trial by saying that the, there was no case to answer and Sharon has been speculating about this. Now what you're going to hear in the next few minutes is, is extraordinary but let me tell you it's absolutely true. They were talking about the the pathologist who gave evidence against Mark at the trial and his name is Alan Anscombe and this is very important when you talk about corruption 
and when you talk about cover-ups. Because Sharon, Alan Anscombe testified in court that he performed the initial and only autopsy on Charlotte. That's what he said. This is this is in the this is in the record. He um, and before we talk about that, and then um, we talk about then this Doctor White, and subsequently you finding out that there may have been other people involved. This guy Anscombe testified that he and he alone did the autopsy. Before we talk about anything else, what did he say he found? What were his findings? Well, it was um, Alan Anscombe. Um was I mean I had an issue with this at the very beginning because I said hang on he's just a normal I don't know why my brain was actually functioning as well as it was at that time I was saying no we need a pediatric pathologist this is a tiny baby this is a big difference between an adult and and a baby um the police at that time said well there aren't any pediatric um pathologists subsequently found out that's not quite true and at that stage we had enough money if I if if I, I would have flown one from the other side of the world to find out what was going on. Um, Anscombe basically corroborated um, by this time. We've got Alan. This is right in the early days. This is like the CPS at that time, their little dream team of medical experts, which consisted of a doctor um, punt. That is with a P, although we've said it with a C a few times. Um, Dr. Jaspin. And Anscombe, the little, the oh, and and a woman called Christine Hall, who was um, a radiologist, professor of radiology. Now, Anscombe basically built his pathology report around what the others had said. So, um, Dr. Jaspin, who was a neuropathologist, I believe, or something like that. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, around that type of thing. If I'm getting my terminology wrong, it's it's like not 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 that important. Um, he actually was the one that um, he came out with that um, Charlotte had skull fractures in the very early days. They needed that skull fracture for that charge. Um, later, it turned out, oh no, she hasn't got a skull fracture. Um, so basically, it was Anscombe, Punt and Jaspin and this Christine Hall that were finding fractures everywhere. Some that were there weren't there. Someone was saying 16. Someone else was saying 32. There was a skull fracture. Turned out there absolutely wasn't a skull fracture. But he only conceded that um, during the trial. The company line all the way through was that it was a skull fracture. Of course it wasn't. Babies have three three actual fractures in their skulls otherwise they can't get out how did he excuse reversing himself in the trial he said that charlotte had a skull fracture she didn't and then he had uh, to acknowledge that she hadn't how was he able to explain that away um well, he Sharon? didn't even try to explain it away he just went oh yeah on reflection um the, no there is no skull fracture wow that was it. It was so blase. And it was like, hang on a minute. If it hadn't have been for that skull fracture, you couldn't have got that charge in the first place. He's a liar then. Oh, complete liar. Yeah, complete liar. Uh, yeah. But but the problem is, if you or I, um, like this is what's so wrong with all these medical experts. This is a business. Uh, getting 1,500 quid a report, and they write lots of reports over the course of a trial, plus their two, three, four grand a day that to they testify. get for being, yeah, 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 yeah. For, for turning up, and then they rehash it all in the family court anyway. So this is big business. Um, and basically, any medical expert can get away with saying whatever they want, because if you and I out and out lied, we would be done for it. Medical experts get away with it by the fact that they go, yeah, but this is my opinion. So Anscombe used these guys and their dubious reports to basically yeah. say that this was, there's, this has been described so many ways and, and you are a verifiable expert in this, of course you are. So um, shaken baby syndrome, shaken infant syndrome, that's what they wanted to ultimately get the jury to find, that Mark had been violently abusive, shaking the baby because, God love her, she was unwell, Mark had lost his patience, he'd shaken her and knocked her about, and that's what they tried to say, basically. 
that is what they tried to say. I mean, in in the course of this trial going on, I turned into my own medical expert and I'd gone finding all sorts of things out um, because obviously I was a prosecution witness. So I didn't know what what I was kind of kept in the dark with an awful lot of it. Um, obviously, I found out they're not that clever, are they? Um, but but what I, I I went to research centres because they were saying like that this Christine Hall, the radiologist, was finding all these fractures that to this day no one knows if they were there or not. Um, she was saying stupid things like the force needed would be equivalent of a 60 mile an hour car crash or being dropped out of a four story window. Well. Obviously not. No, because she would um, die. I mean, she was uh, she was a ten week old baby. If yeah. she was hit with blunt force trauma akin to sixty mile an hour or four story drops, she would die, right? Exactly. And and I went to car seat manufacturers and stuff like that, and and like was going right. If we do the average length of a man's arm, like. Is it physically possible no, to isn't. shake a baby to death in with that amount of force that they, by their own pro- proclamation, this is what's needed? Um, and it turned out it wasn't. So then that term of shaken baby dropped out of it and it, it rebranded itself then. It rebranded itself into shaken impact baby. Shaken oh, impact so baby. You've got to yeah. smash their head on the wall now. Or on a floor, or on a banister, because yeah, it was proved. Like the the, the maths that I I established, um, the scientists that I spoke to, they weren't anything to do with this filthy court industry. They had no vested interest. They weren't going to be called as witnesses. But I needed to know for my own benefit. So I'm shouting this from the rooftops, aren't I? I'm like, but this doctor's saying this. Have you checked that? What about that? Because I'm one angry lady. Um, you know, I'm I'm seeing a system that isn't interested in finding the truth. It's just, as far as I'm concerned, it's interested in destroying my family. 5.6, so- 5.7 million pounds was spent on a farcical prosecution of a man yep. who it was patently obvious had nothing to do with the death of his daughter. You're talking millions and you summed it up brilliantly in the information you sent to me and all the evidence you sent me. The thousands and thousands of pounds being paid to experts to testify whatever the Crown Prosecution Service wants them to testify. I mean, I've covered cases like this before. I mean, it's absolutely shocking. It's a massive, big industry. And you made an amazing statement earlier on. You said no matter what the legacy is, no matter what the wreckage is that's left behind, it doesn't matter. We'll do everything we can to secure a conviction, including absolute lying about about our findings, collusion between people to make it look like this man could have done something that he couldn't have physically done, despite the nurses saying it wasn't a mark on the baby, not a mark on the child. Well, this is, it so, was it was also um, quite quite um, telling that I uh, I was kept away out of the courtroom until I'd given my evidence, and you never quite know when you've got to go on the stand. Um, so there was a couple of days that I was sitting like in the court outside of the courtroom um, with my family liaison officer, and. I was sitting about three spaces away from this Dr. Antonio, the guy who was shitting himself like someone's going to lose their job. Now, the CPS barrister was there with him and the hospital had their legal department too. And they were coaching him on his statement. And basically in his statement, it reads like you wouldn't trust him with a gerbil because he couldn't remember a single thing can't remember anything, he can't get told off for it. His memory was um, full of holes. Yeah, yeah, it, it was the best selective memory. Um, you, you know, you wouldn't have even employed this person to feed your goldfish if, you know, he's supposed to be this paediatric, you know, a paediatrician um, ahead of, of a, a ward um, in a hospital. And this guy's attention to detail, his statements, he couldn't, get, he couldn't keep his lies straight, so he just decided he couldn't remember anything. And I think because he was such a bloody liability, um, that's why he was surrounded by legals. And and they were nothing to do with the case. These were legals for Winchester Hospital and um, Hampshire NHS Trust. They, and, and I think they who, come up... Yeah, who were obviously the, terrified of what might emerge. 
and were terrified about the possibility that they might be liable. Um, there's, there's no doubt about that. We're going to take a very quick break. Um, Sharon Gale is our guest and, and folks, let me tell you, and there's no melodrama here. You haven't heard the half of it. You haven't heard the half of it. We're talking about the, the, the wrongful death of um of 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 Sharon's daughter Charlotte who died aged only ten weeks old back in two thousand and one the wrongful death of Charlotte the attempts to cover up what happened to her by the state by um y- 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 you know by the guardians of the state pathologists and doctors and others and we're we're talking about the court case Sharon's ex husband Mark was blamed wrongfully for the death of Charlotte he was acquitted. And when we come back, we're going to talk about Sharon's determination because she was never going to leave it there uh, to find out what did happen. And we'll take it on from there. Sharon is going to stay with us. It's exactly two minutes to the top of the hour. It's only a 90 second break. Sharon Gale is our guest. Don't miss this. Back with more in two minutes. This is Tuesday's Richie Allen Show live on richieallen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2, Tune in Radio and TriggerWarning.tv. There's a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others. Become part of this ever-growing worldwide family of unique, pure energy healing practitioners. Discover how amazing you truly are. Go to www www.markbayerski.com It could just change your life forever. Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. Asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. Welcome back. This is a vital program, absolutely vital. Sharon Gale is on the line. Back in 2001, Sharon and her ex-husband Mark were in the national spotlight, in the glare of the media, when Mark was blamed for the death of baby Charlotte, who died aged 10 weeks old. He was accused of shaken baby syndrome, shaken in infant impact syndrome and all manner of nonsense by people who were determined to cover up what had really happened to her. There was no evidence that Mark did that. In fact, all the evidence they had was to the contrary. Okay, in terms of all the physical evidence, the statements from nurses and doctors who'd seen Charlotte, um, Sharon's own uh, testimony as uh, Charlotte's mother. We've talked about the vaccinations that she received and we will talk about those and we'll talk about a very interesting doctor who had a lot to say about Charlotte's case. We'll talk about that shortly. Um, the the D, I, I always forget that, the DTAP, the MMR, the meningitis vaccine that she got and how she became very, very unwell very suddenly after receiving those vaccinations and how only a few days later her health deteriorated to the point that um, her life support machine and system was was switched off. We've talked about the the coroner, a man called Alan Anscombe who testified against Sharon's husband, ex-husband Mark in court and how he had used reports from two other physicians and tried to create this idea, this story, this narrative that uh, Mark had been monstrously brutal in terms of the violence he inflicted on 
uh, baby Charlotte, which uh, he didn't. The judge said there was no case to answer. He called a halt to the trial and stopped it and acquitted Mark. And Sharon stays with us now because this is where it gets going, really. Amazingly, after everything you've told us, Sharon, Mark is acquitted. Can't imagine what that was like, you know, whether you were relieved, both of you, whether you were numb because of everything that had happened. But of course, rather, I suppose, I mean, I spoke to you about this the other day, but you're going to talk about this now. Rather than, I suppose, bask in or relax in the the aftermath of that and not having to deal with the conviction, um, you decide that you want answers. And I want you to take it from there. Well, well, it, it needed there, there needed to be answers because during this time, I'd ended up um, obviously stumbling across this revolting underbelly of the medical mafia. Really, um, how 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 just how stinking everything was for me. It wasn't an option to go yippity do. That's all over. Um, on retrospect, that's exactly what I should have done. Because when you think, you think, well, nothing can be worse than this. What have I got to lose? As it turns out, everything. Um, so it, it was a lot different for my ex-husband because, it, I mean, he'd been in prison, for Christ's sake, on the Nazi's wing. You, you know, this is someone who was a public school boy. This couldn't have been further than than what his very middle class life had always been. Mine wasn't. I was brought up on a crappy council estate. Um, but but so for him, um, he didn't. And this is where we had. I think this would be the reason that our, our marriage just didn't survive it because he just wanted wanted it all to go away, and I couldn't. So we had that massive divide then. Um, and, and of course, this is this had worked to treat because we'd been played off against each other for years because with me being a prosecution witness, all his family, uh, they didn't want anything to do with me. I had no choice. I didn't want to be a prosecution witness. Um, so we had this huge divide where he he basically wanted just to get on with his life, draw a line under this horrific thing. And I just could not leave it alone. Um, by the way, Sharon, by the way, that was unusual, you being compelled to testify against Mark. I asked you about this on Thursday. Yeah. That was unusual, right? Yeah, I mean, um, well, a lot of people, such as yourself, you, um, thought if this was your partner, your spouse, your yeah. husband, wife, you couldn't be forced to testify against against your, your other half. Um, that, that year, I think... Um, they'd actually changed that rule. So now they can force you to testify to mm -hmm. be a prosecution witness, um, which obviously juries don't know the full story. And they only saw me for, what, three, four hours giving evidence. By the very fact you're on that list as the mother of that child and the wife of that person, but your name comes under their prosecution, it automatically looks like you believe the case. Obviously, during evidence, that, that didn't come out at all. Um, I, I think I was probably the only person who didn't lie during that trial because I wanted to know the truth of what happened. I wasn't going to elaborate. I told everything as it was. I was portrayed in the newspapers as being this like like middle-class woman. They asked me if, if I had private gym membership. And, yeah, I did. I did. This seemed noteworthy to the newspapers that I had such a lavish lifestyle that I was driving a BMW, there was an Audi on the drive, and I had a um, private gym at the David Lloyd. It wasn't relevant, but it, it, it was like painting a picture. Yeah. And, and it was like, wow, of all the stuff that's come out, you're reporting this. It's a drama. Right? They're, they're not there to, to search for the facts and the truth. They're there to create a story. We've talked about this. I know you've talked about it. I've talked about it a lot with people. What Sharon is, the picture Sharon is painting there is absolutely, hugely important. This is exactly what they do. They're not looking well, for the information that you found, Sharon. We're going to talk about this right now and you're, I'm going to shut up and you're just going to take us through the things you found. But these were things the national press could have found with their resources uh, well in two or three phone calls. Easily. I mean, and, and as a as a quite funny example of how, how we were portrayed as this 
very middle class, absolutely loaded. He was the big businessman. No, we weren't. The company was turning over probably about 1.2 million. Uh, you know, we weren't the Rockefellers by any stretch. But even even when they took a photo of our house, they took it at such an angle and airbrushed a bush out um, that even my next door neighbours were laughing, going, hey, hang on, when did our house turn into your house as well? So How they cynical. doubled the size of the house just for the photo. How disgustingly <laughs> cynical that is. That's the, it's anti-journalism, that. It's anti-journalism, isn't it? It's everything. It goes against every ethic and every principle that a journalist should have. Right, it's seven minutes past the hour. Let's let's talk about, and and thanks for speaking candidly about the difficulties you and, and, and Mark had. God love him. I can, I can sympathise without ever knowing what he went through, but his willingness or his wanting to just be, to be done with it. I think I could probably try to understand that while equally understanding that as, you know, her mum, that you're determined that, no, we're not having this, we're going to find out what happened. How did you begin then to start to piece together what had really happened in the time well, from the, the vaccinations to her getting really ill and the rest of it? How did you do that? Well, be, I was, because the trial took so long, um, like from when from when Charlotte died to actually it getting chucked out, it was over three years. So by this time, I'm I'm not accepting at all. And I've had pressure put on me from the police. They were telling me things about the case they should never have been telling me, um, considering I was a witness. Um, obviously, then you have the social services bastards creeping around and generally making a shit situation a hundred times worse. Um, so I'm on my own investigation. The only one who's going to sort this mess out, I had in my mind, was me. Let's find out what happened. So I just turned into a internet person um, and was looking for medical medical experts all around the world, which I found. Um, you've had Christina England on before, um, where she'd written the book with um, Harold, Harold Buttram. Well, he was um, probably about the third expert that I'd found. Um, the first being Michael Innes in Australia, who was a, a pathologist and hematologist. Um, then I found Archie Calacarinos, um, and then Harold Buttram, and then a beautiful old chap, Dr. Clementson. And the, I was get, getting reports off of them um, that they were getting the medical evidence boxed up and flown all around the world. And they were writing their reports off the back of this. Um, they were very much in the agreement. This vaccines, of course, this death. Um, these experts were absolutely ridiculed in the hearings that led up to the trials. They, the, the police, the CPS, they found out. I mean, it must have taken some time. They found out that I'd been on a website um, with regards to a guy called Alan Yurko in America who'd been um, in prison for many years for a shaken baby. And it was like on on this website, it was there was a page right at the back put your name down in support of, of this guy getting a retrial. I'd just put my name down there. They'd found that out. I mean, so you were being <laughs> followed then, basically. You, your, your online footprint was being followed while this was going on, right? Definitely. And there was things that were coming out in the newspapers that I knew hadn't come out in that trial. And I knew that um, I had only discuss these things with the doctors that I was talking to independently. These weren't in court documents, they weren't in court witnesses, but there was stuff coming out um, that I knew were private conversations that I was having with these doctors at like three o'clock in the morning, you kind of think, because of being Australian and all sorts. And um, and and so that that was kind of, I was already in my up to my neck in trying to find out what happened through the whole trial because I could see no truth was going to come out here. Can I say um, something there, Sharon? Can I jump in? Can I say something there? This is important because it's interesting you said that Michael, Dr. Michael Innes and others were being ridiculed. And um, I have no doubt that you're right. But from the documentation that you've managed to get, and I, I, you've done some job, by the, it's an incredible job you've done over the years, the Crown Prosecution Service was very nervous of Michael Innes and was very oh, nervous, I weren't they? Because Innes's work over years has determined 
that one of the things that the DTP vaccine can do, the DTAP vaccine can do, and this is this is fact, this isn't um, anti-vax conspiracy theory, it can cause serious vitamin C depletion, which can have catastrophic consequences in the liver, the adrenal glands and the blood. This is a fact. And Innes knew this and had been writing about it for years and they must have been, well, let's say they were very nervous about Innes and what he was saying. Well, this I, I, I found Michael Innes by um, the British Met, going on the BMJ website. Um, and he'd commented on um, on a case very similar to Charlotte's. And so I managed to track him down. I don't even know how I found these people, but I, I don't know. D- divine intervention, whatever you want to call it. Luck was on my side because literally it took me about three weeks to find the email addresses and telephone numbers of everybody that I needed. Um try and find this information now you can't find it you know it's been well buried in the darkest depths of the internet these guys you can't get in can't get hold of them anymore i mean i'm still in touch with miss uh, michael innes but um and i was with dr calicarinos as well until he passed away so my my investigation was going on all through the trial um and stupidly at the very beginning i was running back to my family liaison officer going have they checked for this have they checked for that what about this blood count what about the von wilbram counts they were elevated this that and the other so basically i was like giving it to them on a plate and then i realized this is like not that these people are not here to find the truth um so in one of um one of the trials that started um this may have been the second or the third one these experts were supposed to be flying over. Dr. Innes, Dr. Calicarinos, Dr. Clements and Dr. Buttram were all supposed to be coming to give evidence. Now, that trial, I'd, I'd remembered that they'd taken a skin sample from, from Charlotte in Great Ormond Street. And this result wasn't in anywhere and I couldn't find it. And I was jumping up and down um, to to like my husband's legals and stuff like that. Um, where's this skin sample? Because this would prove conclusively one way or the other whether what the, the this what these doctors are saying would be in that sample. Well, all of a sudden the sample didn't exist. For years the sample didn't exist. And then all of a sudden the sample did exist. Well the trial collapsed then. There was it, it stopped because now they've got to get this sample. So they've they've basically these doctors were at the airport they were waiting to come over um and and it all got stopped again wow this skin sample ultimately went missing again or it had been incorrectly stored we had so many stories it never happened during this time and i'll never know what happened during this time because this was between my my um ex-husband and his legals he basically changed changed his mind. He wasn't going to have these medical experts as his defence. Um, Why? And, because and of the cost? The, the cost must have been very high, was it? Um, no, it was. I mean, they, they were happy to come and work for nothing compared with the British ones, to be honest. It wasn't a cost issue um, because once you're like the legal aid would have picked this up because we'd already burnt through our savings by then. Um, and so legal aid would have picked the tab up. I think that there was a reason that even these defence solicitors did not want to go down the vaccine route. I just they just didn't want to do it. You're hinting then, you're hinting there that Mark's own counsel, his own QC, might have had some pressure applied with respect to the whole vaccination thing. It it was either it was either that or um the solicitors were going there and basically frightening him that you're not going to win off of this well in the end council got changed and i don't know why it got changed he ended up going from having sally clark's um legal team to bill bash who was i think angela canning's legals um and so they then brought in another different group of um group of their own experts um and that was the end of it for michael innes and all the rest of them they never got to say that in court and and i don't think they ever would be allowed to say that in court to be honest um i mean you've only got to look what they've done to wayne squire who we did have on board at that time because this was in the early days before she'd had her career ruined and frightened out of ever giving evidence in court again um and the same with Jan Geddes, 
um, who had who had her career absolutely ripped apart. So trying to find now, I, I, I mean, I still get emails from people who are accused of this. Now, we were in a terrible situation to try and find medical experts. There are none now. None there are, there are none. There are none now who will be able to or, or, or would be prepared to come and testify in open court or they've been scared away. You mentioned Wayne Squire. We know all about Wayne. So I want to move this on then to, 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 to after the trial. Just to remind our listeners, Sharon Gale is live on the line. We're talking about her case which um, came to national prominence back in 2001. It's not Sharon's case, but it was the case of the wrongful death of her child, her baby, 10-week-old baby Charlotte, and it was a wrongful death. Her ex-husband was was accused of it, despite the fact that it was obvious that he didn't do it. There was no evidence to suggest that he did it. Um, there's a strong suspicion that Charlotte's illness developed very quickly because of a adverse reaction to a number of vaccinations that she received against um, Sharon's wishes, it must be said, uh, as well. We've talked about the, you know, some of the farcical elements of the trial. We've talked about the coroner. And we'll come back to him, Alan Anscombe. And I want to move this on um, because w- at what point then in in the, the the intermitting period after the trial did you start to get some, let's call it blowback, or a reaction from the authorities because of the questions you were asking and the areas that you were going down? Instantly. I mean, there, there was no respite from this because um, it, 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 the time frame is so long um, that after the criminal trial had finished, um, there was no whoopity do, everyone fuck off, we're going to be left to get on with it. Oh, no, 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 no. Within three days of that trial finishing, um, there was a court order from social services. We still we weren't allowed to live as a family um, because he wasn't allowed to be around children. Um, So then we had another year and a half of the family court trial, um, which was a complete carnage because basically I don't know why any of us bothered turning up because no one ever wins in that. Um, And so the stipulation was put that basically... As long as as long as there was children involved, there's no way that my husband and I were ever going to be allowed to live together. Um, so obviously there's a load of infighting between me and him because it's years now and we're trying to keep a marriage together when we haven't been under the same roof for years. Um, I ended up pissing off um, to Barcelona, well, just outside of Barcelona. And basically we were doing that um, because I just could not stand the intrusion of social services anymore. They had no um, and, right to be there, Sharon. Mark had been acquitted. They had no right to be there. There was no legitimate reason to claim that your other children were in any danger. None at all. No, there was there, there was no 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 reason for it whatsoever. Um, was it retaliation? Do you think? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I I gave. I've got to be careful because I although the the care order has been discharged, um, like with regards to this. I'm not quite sure how how much I can say of what happened in that trial, but basically we may as well not have bothered having any medical experts there um, because the same old crew that were in the criminal trial turned up and and the, the the judge lapped it up and that was the end of that. He ended up with a finding a finding against him in, in that in all intents and purposes. So so we're still not allowed to be a family. I'm still trying to fight for my family because because it's still in my head. If I find out what's caused this, everything will go away. You know, it will be gone. Um, in the end, the pressure from social services was so extreme and the intrusion was so awful um, that I, 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 I took, took off um, and we, we went, to, went to Spain. He still had the company in the UK and basically he, we were living like a secret hidden life halfway up a mountain in, in just outside in between Girona and Barcelona. Um, social services bloody tracked us down there. And so then I flew to New Zealand, told them I was going on holiday and then just didn't come back. Um, They tracked us to New Zealand. I had social services over us in New Zealand. And in the end, I was like, right, we're going to have to come back. This is ridiculous. It's not solving anything by running away, isn't it? Um, 
it came came back. Um, so I think right bollocks. I'm I'm going to start ramping this up. Goes, what year was this, Sharon? We came back uh, two thousand and eight, I think two thousand and seven, two thousand and eight. And there was four we, of you. Yeah, four, and four and um, so I I came back and and I started getting in touch with my MP. I started going. Um, I'd got in touch with um, Earl Howe um, via an educational psychologist that I knew. Um, and and really started ramping up. Where's this death certificate? Where's right, the this? death certificate. Let, let, let's make let's let's remind our listeners. So now we're we're seven years after Charlotte's death, and you've listened to Sharon. I'm not going to repeat what she said there. They were put through the mill, punished effectively because the of the acquittal of Mark. Um, you know, trying to live their lives as a family in different parts of the world. I mean, this is madness that anybody should be put through this. Eventually, after going to Spain and New Zealand, they come back to the UK and we're back again to the fact that seven years after Charlotte died, there was no death certificate. And I can't impress upon you how serious this is and how important it is. So you get in touch with politicians and yeah. people. I mean, my, my marriage is over by now. Um, and, um, and, and so that, that kind of, we have definitely gone our own separate ways. Um, uh, um, because I was driving him insane. I wouldn't leave it alone. I was still talking to the medical experts. I was like setting my alarm in the middle of the night so I could speak to someone in Belgium or in Saudi or, you know, it, it was, a, it was too much for him to live this every day. Um, or even one day a week was too much kind of thing. Um, so I came back and it was like, right, the, my family is decimated. Um, I'm going to go at this now, all, all, all guns blazing. So I'd got in touch with um, people who put me in touch with, well, I'd got in touch with my MP. I'd been up at the house, uh, up at Westminster. I'd had appointments at Port Cullis House. And eventually a death, the, the death certificate turns up. During this time, you discover nine ton of other horrific rubbish, um, not even all of it to do with me, but just poor other poor souls that didn't quite have the the same ability to withstand what I was withstanding. You know, people were killing themselves. You, you know, this is a whole nother program in itself, so I won't deviate off too too much. Um, so now, like for me, it felt like there wasn't just a responsibility to Charlotte and my family because there was no way I was going to have my great, 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 great grandchildren looking up their family tree and finding out that someone had been murdered by their own father. That's a legacy I'm not going to have ever. You know, it, it, it's a legacy that's there now, um, but it needs to go because who wants that for history? You know, in a hundred years time, that's still there. Um, so eventually we get the death certificate. Uh, this takes from 2008, 9, 10, 11. This takes another four years of up up and down, up and down to the Houses of Parliament. This is unprecedented this is now. This is unprecedented that anybody would have to go through this to get a death certificate, right? It's unprecedented. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I mean... Um, the. Because there's there's lots in this in this situation that aren't exclusive to me. Other people have been put through it, um, but this situation is I've not heard of this before, um, and it's probably because people give up halfway through. They don't keep on, um, and I kept on and on and on. In the end, a death certificate was produced, a completely fraudulent document. You've seen it, Richie, haven't you? I'm looking at it now. It. it it's not even my name on there, is it? No. <laughs> you know, when when and that felt like you've done that on purpose just to insult me a bit more, but then paranoia does creep in in this situation, that's for sure. Um that just looking at the date it was issued. Um you know, this made me feel worse. This made me feel worse because I was like, thank God at least I've done that. At least I've got a death certificate. Well, a cause of death isn't shaken baby. That's not a cause of death. Subdual hematomas, brain injury, that's a cause of death. But that term in itself isn't a cause of death. 
when it's dated is completely incorrect. It, it would have been physically impossible for that document to have been produced when it says on that, because this was in the December, early December when Charlotte died. Now, let's not forget, the, these, these court people and these medical experts, they all had Christmas and New Year off. No, this is evidence of monumental fraud. What Sharon yeah. is telling you there is the death certificate is dated January 2nd, 2002. When you think that um, Charlotte had only been dead a few weeks and when you factor in that at that time and even today it takes and would take several months to determine if a child had been um, killed because she'd been violently shaken. It would have taken months. So I can say without any fear of contradiction the death certificate is provably a fraudulent document and whoever issued that document and sent that through the through the post to, Char, uh, to, to Sharon has committed a crime and a very serious crime. It's a fraudulent document. It says cause of death shaken impact syndrome, date of registration, January 2nd, 2002. It's an impossibility. It's practically impossible that it could have been determined that that was the cause of death at that stage. So it is a fraudulent document. So you know you've got a fraudulent document, right? So Yeah, well, I mean, I was just absolutely devastated because as soon as I uh, I was told, yes, go down to wherever up in London because she died in Great Ormond Street, go to this registry, registrars and the documents there, you've just got to, the cheek of it. You've just got to pay your 20 quid. I paid for that piece of shit. <laughs> 20 quid 20 quid it doesn't matter but the point of it is it was like great and when I actually looked at it and I was like I have waited all those years for something that's just a complete fraud because what had come out in those documents that I showed you that Lord um, Earl Howard been extracting over the years um and and it was like so they've just produced something to like oh just give her a sodding death certificate and she'll fuck off well or it was an insult on top of an insult tip her over the edge i don't know um wh whoever produced that knew that they were making it up i whoever, whoever sat there and typed that crap on the system knew that they were making it up because they clearly didn't have anything in front of them no inquest had been held no inquest had been held and again it's unprecedented after the trial and after mark had been acquitted it should have triggered an inquest immediately it would have in every other case and the fact that an inquest wasn't called um, by the coroner is an absolute anomaly it's an anomaly now mindful of just slightly moving this on that document is fraudulent that's evidence of a cover-up you think, and I can understand why you think it, that it might lean towards them winding you up or having a laugh at you. They're not that stupid. I think the document is part of the cover-up. I think they're giving you something hoping that you'll go away. And yeah, it's, it was it's it's like rubbish. give a dog a bone kind of thing. Yeah, but, but, but you know, whoever wrote that put themselves in serious jeopardy. Because that, wh wh whoever forged that document is, is in danger or would be in danger of going to prison for it. That's a monumental crime, the forging of that death certificate. It's a monumental crime. Who's Dr. White then? Let's go back a bit because Alan Anscombe is, was the coroner, Hampshire, um, Home Office. Uh, he he was a pathologist. pathologist. Dr. Anscombe was a pathologist. Um, the Testified in court. Sorry, sorry you're, right, you're right to correct me there. He was the pathologist who did the autopsy. He testified in court. Alan Anscombe testified in court. I did the autopsy. I did the first autopsy. It was just me. That was him, Alan Anscombe, the pathologist. So when did you start hearing about a Dr. White who you'd never heard about before? Never well, mentioned anywhere. Go ahead. Well, what happened was I'd heard this Dr. White pop up before, but I couldn't get anything in writing um, because the sort of whole of Hampshire sort of like everything medical coroner's office was kind of like on shutdown as soon as they knew it was on the phone and then one time I'd phoned the coroner's office trying to speak to this guy and to make an appointment to come and meet him and and I'd and 
the woman just picked up the like picked up the phone and clearly she had no idea who she was talking to really with regards to don't touch this person with a barge pole and and I gave her the the details of of Charlotte's sort of date of birth and death and all the rest of it um, because this was still in the quest to try and get a death certificate to find out what on earth was on there um, and she was like, and I said, oh, and the um, um, the post mortem was the autopsy was done by um, Alan Anscombe. Well, she just pulled this file out, and she went, oh no, no, um, the the pathology was conducted by Dr. White. Um, I subsequently found out that yeah, that would have been very normal because Dr. White was on this Hampshire sort of South Circuit kind of thing, so. In a normal case, this Dr. White would have been the one who would have done it. And and I didn't. And, and then sort of like she wasn't going to send me any documents or anything like that. And the coroner, Dr. Short, never did phone me back, lied later on and said that I'd never been in touch with them to try and request an inquest and all the rest of it. So another liar. Um, so who did the I, autopsy then, White or Anscombe? Well, who knows? Because according to the, the the documents that have come from Westminster that you've got there, when they've replied back to Earl Howe, um, they clearly state Dr. White, don't they? They do. I've got he, it here. He writes back and says, hang on a minute, Dr. White didn't. They then double check it and they say he absolutely did. This is We've never, this we've is never seen a report. But this is corruption on a monumental scale here, this is. Where, like, you have this guy, Anscombe, testifying in open court that he carried out the autopsy. It was him. He did the first aut- autopsy, him and him alone. But you, you found later on that that would have been slightly unusual, that this guy, White, should have done it. So what's gone on there then? Has White not done it and signed that he did it and Anscombe did it in his place? I mean, whatever, it's absolutely critical to find out what happened there well no one will like it, i mean it, it's great isn't it because you get these sort of um parliamentarians or the lords or whatever and they'll start investigating something as soon as something comes back um yeah he pushed for about a whole 20 seconds kind of thing um and then they just refused to answer him and that was the end of that where where else can you go when you've gone to the top of the tree, to the Justice Ministry and the Home Office, and they're basically shutting the door in your face. Where else can you go? Well, the worst of it is, is that you, the people who've acted on your behalf have helped you uncover this filthy, disgusting corruption and fraud. But as we said today, when we had a brief chat today, we were talking, you and I, they don't take it any further. This is the frustrating thing. You know, they they get this information. Oh, Jesus, look, Anscombe perjured himself in court. Well, he might have done by saying he did the autopsy. It should have been White. Now we're hearing that White did it. The, the, the death certificate is a joke. It's a disgrace to the country to send that to the mother of a child. It's obviously a fraud. But then they just stop, Sharon, don't they? They stop. And this is what's happened to you effectively. And I want well, you to take us on to how, I mean, we're talking now about 2010, 2011, 2012. And you've, you've got all this. I mean, you've sent it to me. It's horrible for me to look at this stuff, knowing that you should be telling this story to, to um, we mentioned him today, didn't we? John Sweeney on Panorama. <laughs> That's who should be listening to this, not me, because, sure. because he's got an audience of three million people. It's good. Well, I mean, I've burnt through more MPs than to, because particularly because I've moved house a fair bit. Um, so you get a different MP every time, don't you? I've, but I've burnt through yeah. MPs like I get through shoes, you know, over the course of this time. They get to a point with it um, and one MP turned around to me and, and I was like, why are you not helping? Why have you stopped? You promised me that you would help. You said that this was disgusting. This could happen to one of your children. Yeah. Like all that mouth shit, really didn't mean any of it, and and he just point blank, not even a smirk on his face, deadly serious, like if I was saying, oh, this is the price for your quote at work, kind of thing. Very matter of fact, yeah. But the problem is, Mrs. Zatter, as I was at that stage, um, I've been told that this could be incredibly career limiting for me, and I went career limiting. I'll give you fucking career limiting, and went absolutely. He said that to your face, right? This could be yeah. career limiting to me. 
your yep. your family has been destroyed. Your baby daughter is dead. You've 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 got documents, um, Sharon. You've got documents. You've shown me. Um, it's all there. Collusion, corruption, fraud proof. But um, ah, fuck off because it could ruin my career. Lovely. Well, it was karma with this particular MP because he later on got caught um, by the Sun newspaper shagging rent boys dressed up in West Ham football kit. So uh, that we, was we know, we know, we, we know who it is now. What, <laughs> what, what led up? And by the way, we must, we, we must mention without dwelling on it, without dwelling on it, um, a number of national newspapers and magazines um, took um, professional photographs of Sharon, got the story saw what I saw in the last few days because Sharon showed them all the information. Promises were made about this going to the national papers, this massive scandal about the cover-up of the death of a baby and all of that. Um, you, you were obviously excited, Sharon, but none of this materialised. Um, well, I was in... I, I mean, anything with the press um, with, with regards to myself... It's kind of like a double edged sword because when you've been in that situation and your whole existence has been slapped on a tabloid, written in such a way that you wouldn't even recognise it as your own existence. Um, I'm I'm I have been an incredibly private person. Um just because that situation has put me off of of anything like that um because they terrorized us the press terrorized us for three odd years you know there there was no escape they were literally hiding in the bushes opposite my house like you know yeah. looking for that photo of me trying to cover my son's face and with tears down my eyes they never did get that photo they never were going to so when it was coming to go to the press um, it was kind of like a bittersweet thing. But then I thought, bollocks, I've lost my marriage. My family's been decimated. My career's quickly going down the swanee. My house has been sold. Um, what have I got to lose? And and so it was, well, at least I can put the record straight here because you look it up on the internet and, and that crap's still there for all to read. My son's looked it up and was furious because he read it and he was convinced my ex had killed Charlotte. Um, you know, so if, if nothing else, going to the press was going to neutralise that to give the other, other side because the story has moved on from when the newspapers got bored of it, when the trial would finish. It, it's nothing like that now. It's completely morphed into something else. Um, so, yeah, I was I was um, I was planning just to sod off to Spain when that 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 story came out for a week and let it all die down and and come sneak back in again and but at least the truth would have been out there. Um, so, but yeah, I was I was devastated when when you know my daughter and myself and this situation we may as well have a big white cross painted on our front door. It's like being lepers of society. No one wants to touch this, and why not? This was taxpayers' money, five and a half million quid's worth of taxpayers' money without the family court trial, which would have run into another million and a half. But no one, want, you know, it, it just didn't happen. It, it just didn't happen. I mean, I had people going, oh, do you want to go on this morning? And I was like, oh, not really. No, not really a TV person. But I would have done it to get the truth out there. I wouldn't have been wanting to be some Z-list celebrity for the day because I'd had my taste of that during the trial and it, I wouldn't have been going there for any other reason than than to, to get this out there, that, that you cannot trust a single department that has government attached to it in this country because it's all corrupt. And if that would have brought out another 20 me's where this situation has happened, then you get in the bracket of, hang on a minute, we might find other people and take a class action here. But it never did happen, so I don't know if there's any more. Well, I know that I know the situation still goes on. They're prosecuting 250 shaken baby cases a year in the UK, about 1,500 in America. Um, so that's 250 families that get get ruined every year. Sharon Gale is our guest live from the south coast. We're we're getting to um, we're getting we're we're getting close to coming towards where where we are today and. Um, it's not nice. We're we're going to talk about you, you left the country again a few years ago, and yeah. it was because you were you'd come into contact with the 
the authorities, the social services, the police. And you said to me pretty candidly the other day, you were getting tired of them turning up and you'd pushed one of them or two of them. Now, it must be said, Sharon is about five five and weighs about four stones soaking wet, it must be said. I put a picture of her on um, Facebook today so you can see um, Sharon, if you want to have a look at Sharon, so you can put a face to to the voice. And... um, this that was escalating and and there was a case pending against you and you thought well to hell yeah. with this i'm going to leave well i mean i'd i'd moved from where where this all happened um like the bishop's waltham area um uh, it, like time had moved on and all the rest of it um and my son was starting college um so the college that he wanted to was fortunately right out of the area so it was a good excuse to move and get away from it because i was getting harassed Um, strangely um, and this is where people still are inherently good this small village where I lived not one person was vile not one person literally we were so lucky as a little family because it was like the community put its arms around us and didn't believe anything in the press we had no problem there with people um, which was which was a godsend because had they the whole village kind of like turned against us, I probably would have topped myself, you know, because yeah. it, it just would have been too isolating. And that was you, but, your son, and your oldest daughter there. I'm, no, no, correct me now. Here. Uh, yeah, me, my son and I. Yeah. Your son, your, your son and yourself, right? Excuse me. Yeah, yeah. and um, well, so this uh, I moved a reasonable distance from from where we we used to live, a good say twenty five miles um, down down to the south coast. Um, I was walking down the street um, with a friend of mine who I sort of knew what was going on. This is going to be a shock if people who know me hear this. This is going to be a shock because I've obviously things have happened and I've been upset and I've said little bits, but never the whole thing to anybody. Um, I was walking down the street and a policeman came up to my friend and I said, you don't need to talk to him, just walk away. Um, have we, are we suspected of a crime here? And he said to my friend, is that Sharon Latter from blah, blah, my address in Bishop's Waltham? And, and I went, none of your fucking business and got my friend by the arm and, and walked down the road and I was like, Fuck me! I've only been here a week. They've followed us already. There was no need. It was a sunny day. We were just walking down by the beach on the promenade, kind of thing, just having a catch up. Is that Sharon Latter from blah 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 to my friend? I was like, fuck off, and and it escalated and the harassment, and and it got to the stage where I was just sick of it, and yeah, I buggered off again. Right. Um. We're going to end up in overtime, by the way. I've just, I just, I just got to mention to um, our, our listeners, um, we're going to end up in overtime. Sharon Gale is live on the line from the south coast of the country. This is as important as any story I've ever covered. It really is, folks. Uh, you, when I say I've covered it, none of this is my work. This is Sharon's work. You know, she's come and handed me. If I was in commercial radio back in the 1980s, um, I'd be thrilled with this because... Somebody has come along and told you a story that's incredible, but given you a whole pile of evidence to back up every single thing she said. And it should be a massive story, you see. Um, we're going to go into overtime because we're, 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 you think what's happened is bad. Um, it, it doesn't get any better in, 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 in the period we're going to talk about now. So I'll tell you what we will do. If you want to grab um, a cup of tea or, 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 a, or a glass of something, Sharon, I can make um, this break a little bit longer if you want to do that for a couple of minutes and then um, we'll come back and talk. Like I'm getting a little croaky voice so I'll run down and get a drink of water if you don't mind. Not at all, I'll take a break and um, just pop me a little text to say I'm back and I know you're back and uh, and then we'll pick it up from when you leave the country again and what happens when you leave the country yeah, your relationship and your new baby girl and everything else, we'll talk about that in a minute so go and grab that water uh, Sharon Gale um, look however I say it it's going to sound I don't know kind of sycophantic you, you're, you're listening to an amazing woman here that's been through the kind of desperate stuff that you couldn't even imagine in your worst nightmare you know a, a 10 week old baby dying 
in terrible circumstances, in very, very dubious circumstances. Her ex-husband, a man that she loved, was building a life with, is accused of murdering the baby. He didn't. He had nothing to do with the death of the child. There was no evidence at all. In fact, as I said earlier on, all the evidence was to the contrary. It's all there that he didn't do it. He's put on trial anyway. There's lo- Lies are told from day one. Fractures and bones being broken. None of that was true. In fact, one of the examining physicians who originally testified that there were skull fractures in baby Charlotte, he, he, he later on reversed himself in the trial and said that, oh, well, there weren't, as it happens. Wasn't asked, to, wasn't asked even to explain that. No death certificate issued for years. When it's eventually issued, it's a joke of a document. It's, it's a document that the person who issued it should be arrested and interviewed under caution. It's a fraudulent document. I've got it here in front of me. She didn't get it till 2011. Then the initial, the initial pathologist who said that he testified under oath said that he did the autopsy. Well, we find out then that it wasn't him. It was somebody else called White who should have done it. The guy who said he did it was called Anscom. It's all a mess. It's all a pack of lies. Who did the autopsy? Who didn't do it? Why the confusion? Why when Mark was acquitted of the murder of Charlotte, wasn't there an inquest called? That would have happened anywhere. At any time in this country, there would have been an inquest. It's standard procedure. Harassment of the family after the trial, social services turning up. Right? Mark had a child from a previous relationship. Sharon had her son. They're being harassed. Told that they can't live together. They've broken no laws. Drip, 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 drip. Pressure, pressure, pressure. She's saying, well, fuck it. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not putting up with this. I'm going to find out what happened. Starts to dig, starts to ask questions. And um, certain interests don't like those questions. They start to turn the screw on her. Make life very difficult for her. So she leaves the country. This is we're, we're right up now pretty much to the present day. And sadly, what you're going to hear next is going to shock you. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're not going to close the programme down at the usual time. We're going to keep... Um, Sharon, can, we're, we're, Sharon is going to stay on and take all the time she needs to bring us up to where we are today in 2018. Very quick break. This is your Richie Allen Show. Live on richieallen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 and Tune In Radio. Back in two minutes. There's a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others. Become part of this ever-growing worldwide family of unique, pure energy healing practitioners. Discover how amazing you truly are. Go to www www.markbayerski.com It could just change your life forever. Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. The Richie Allen Show relies on your support. Go to richieallen.co.uk and set up a monthly donation today. I'll do my best to sum it up in 20 seconds. Sharon Gale is live on the line. Her child wrongfully died. Charlotte, her baby, 10-week-old baby girl back in 2001. The What happened to her has been covered up. She has 
it's not overwhelming evidence, it's stone cold proof that the state and the medical fraternities of this country, the medical establishment, have colluded to cover up the death of her child. Not only that, but they tried to fit her husband up for it, her ex-husband, Mark. That didn't work. They then began to target the family afterwards, harassed them, said they couldn't stay together, they couldn't live together, as if the children were in any danger. From Mark and Sharon, they weren't. Sharon uncovered all manner of very, very disturbing things. Um, We talked about the fraudulent death certificate. We talked about the anomalous autopsy. I mean, the death certificate is an absolute red herring because it was dated the 2nd of January 2002, only three weeks after the baby died. God love her. And they said at that stage, well, it was infant, shaken infant syndrome. Couldn't have been. Not in that time period. It would have taken several months Forgetting the fact that it was a Christmas, the Christmas holidays, it would have taken them months with the testing as they would have needed to do to come to that conclusion, even now. Fraud and lies. So Sharon and her son then, um, she's gotten this information, she realises that it's an absolute fraud, that the cover-up, the fix is in, but despite the fact that MPs know all about it, peers... Uh, House of Lords peers know all about it because they've found out this information through writing letters on behalf of Sharon but they're not going to take it any further. She's getting harassed and she decides then that it's time for her and her son to leave the country. So when was this then? This was 2013 I think, is it? Um, Yeah, I think it was late 2013. Uh, Yeah, I think it was, yeah, 2013. So you had Um, a couple of different places. I get mixed up. I feel like I've, like, lived out of a suitcase, like, running around the world kind of thing. But, yeah, approximately. Yeah, so I left the country, just had had enough of it. Um, And um, I actually didn't plan on leaving the country permanently. I just decided that when I was out. Um, and I thought, no bollocks, I'm not going back. Um, so I, I was in um, like Thailand for, for a contract um, for a few months and, and then and then went to um, Bahrain um, where, where, where we, we, we lived for about a year and a half, I think, something like that. And you were and happy there, there, right? You liked Bahrain? I did like, um, I, you know, I did like Bahrain for being... Um, English, um, I wouldn't have wanted to be a Shia in Bahrain. Um, right. What what I found in Bahrain was there was very few rules, and as long as you stuck to them, you got left alone, um, which was quite refreshing and exactly what I needed. Um, and the same in Turkey as well. Um, so so yeah, my my um, I've got to be so careful here. This is the bit that could really get me in trouble. Um, if if you can get in any more trouble than I am anyway. Um, so I, I had, um, a little girl over there. I'm not going to name her because, no. you know, I, I don't know how much I can say without, um, going to prison to be fair. Um, had a little girl over there. Um, they, this, this civil conflict over there was heating up a little bit. And, um, to be honest, it was an astronomically expensive place to live. Um, and, and the work contracts weren't, just weren't coming through quick enough. Um, so I decided we, we like to, to go to Turkey, um, lived there for over a year and, and then, and then came back to the UK, um, didn't register, um, my daughter with a doctor, um, don't need to. I, I medicine isn't something that's been required in in my children's lives. Uh, the one time they had it, look what happened to um, Charlotte. My my son's never had antibiotics in his whole life. He's 21 now. Um, obviously, like this, the, 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 then um, I made the stupid mistake of putting my name on the electoral roll. Schoolgirl error. Should have known. Should this was 2000. This is 2016 now when you came back. Uh, um, just, just for I'm a bit pedantic like that. Just for the timeline. Yeah, not not last, not August just gone. The August before, so yeah. So August 2016. Yeah. We're, we're not going to name your daughter. You didn't um, register her, and you did, unfortunately. Do you know I get the impression, having spoken to you for 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 a while on Thursday, that you're still beating yourself up over that. You can't do that because. You know, 
far smarter men and women than you and I have made mistakes as elementary as that. I wouldn't be beating myself up over it. But you put yourself on the electoral roll and then yeah, you put well, yourself on... I mean, on. There, there was reasons for it. Um, I thought, right, well, I've been back. Um, you know, I haven't... Um, my national insurance number's working. I've never changed that. My NHS number's still there. Haven't changed that. Right. Maybe they've had enough of me. If I keep quiet, leave the Charlotte thing alone, we'll just be left alone and everything will be fine. Everything was fine for a period of time. Um, then um, then, then one day I was um, cooking dinner here and I had friends around, his two children. Uh, my son was here with his girlfriend and obviously my little one. And we had a knock on the door. It was about three o'clock in the afternoon. And it was two policemen at the door um and they're like we're here to do a welfare check i i went on who and they were like um your your child i went what my 21 year old son who's in the living room okay then <laughs> like being a bit cocky because i was terrified inside it was like the duck thing you know calm on the outside the mouth's being like cocky but yeah. like inside my heart's beating out of my chest and thank goodness my friend was there and his girls and he could hear and because I'm going, no, fuck off. If you haven't got a warrant, just go away. Like, I don't need to tell you who I am. I don't need to tell you anything. Get lost. He comes to the door um, and a lot more of a diplomat than me. Um, and, and and he's like, well, can I help you? What's What seems to be the problem? And they've turned around and gone, oh, uh, are, you, are you the father? And he said, um, yes what's the problem and they went oh nothing at all nothing at all and went away and I'm like oh no it started here we go again nothing happened for a while um I had a feeling that strangeness was going on because there was sort of like knocks on my door at three in the morning and considering I'd kept an incredibly low profile there was only about four people in this country that even knew I was back at that stage um least of all where I lived so people don't knock on your door at three in the morning. And, I, and there was like weird stuff going on. And I was getting, I was getting anxious. And and then, um, then, then a particular day, um, life had got a bit extreme. Um, and um, coppers at the door again. And and I can't really tell you any more than that other than uh, my little girl's not here anymore. And this was last um, August, right? Yeah, August just August just gone. Yeah. So you know, people say to me, well, "Do you regret pushing and pushing and pushing?" And I'm in a yeah, absolutely. People say this has happened, like with the vaccine thing and stuff like that. Uh, this has happened to me. Um, what should I do? And I say, leave it alone. Walk away. Do not get involved. If you think what's happened is terrible, then just don't tempt fate, walk away, leave it alone. Yes, it's not right. Yes, it's unjust. Yes, it shouldn't be going going on. Um, but you equally don't want to be in this situation, you know, because I, well, the, the moment that Charlotte died, literally you have nothing in common with anyone ever again. You just don't. You, you see everything differently. Um, and, and there isn't a night's sleep to be had. I mean, everybody knows if they're on my Facebook um, I'm the biggest whinger for insomnia um, and it's really bad for your health you know it's terrible for your health um, and there's nothing to be gained by being honest open and wanting to help other people or least of all wanting to find a very basic thing like what happened to your dead child and this is the UK this is England you know this is how we treat bereaved mothers in the UK, we'll hound them until they either kill themselves, get so poorly they have a heart attack and die, or we just hand them, steal their children, ruin their lives, wreck their reputations, ruin their careers. It, it just never stops. It never stops. And I, and I am concerned about, a, you know, this conversation that we're having tonight. But touch wood you kind of think what 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 worse could happen now really what is left in the armor of destruction kind of thing um and i can't you know short of banging me up in prison well it's a prison anyway 
just slightly bigger. It, the, the, you know, it's um, and the corruption carries on. So I've got a choice now, haven't I? I either curl up and die, or see this thing through a bit more. Go back to another set of MPs, start jumping up and down, um, and really kick off because I, what have I got to be fearful of? It's already happened. Your, your sorry for that echo there. Your um, stance on what happened to Charlotte and the questions about the vaccinations. You don't have to answer any of this now. Of course, you can say no comment or I don't want to answer. But but it's it's relevant. You you feel it's relevant to your three year old daughter being taken last August. A, a contributory factor, yeah, definitely. I mean, when you can't find anything wrong, you got to make some shit up, haven't you? Um, and and I don't, you know, the the vast majority of people kind of don't think that you can be penalised because vaccines aren't mandatory in this country. But honestly, I, I mean, I, I said years ago. Do you remember years ago there was that national lottery advert and the finger come out the sky and it pointed, it's you. Yeah. Um, well, what this country does, if you're a person in my situation, is, oh, yeah, that hand comes out the sky, but it gives you, it flips the bird at you and says, it's you. And and it never, you, you know, you don't need, you don't need anything in a family court. You don't need a shred of evidence. You really don't. It's all closed. They'll reel out whoever. Um, the, it, and, and it really, it can be anyone's family. Um, I, I've said to my son, don't ever have children in this country. If you find yourself a wife and that the minute you get, <laughs> the minute you ha find out that you're having a baby, do not have it in this country. Do not ever come back to this country. And, and you know, what, what a horrible thing to have your mum telling you when you're 21 years old. If you ever get married, if you ever have children, just don't be here. Get out. I'll follow you, you know, kind of thing. But but that's the reality. And it can happen to absolute... Well, it's not... It can happen. It is happening every day of the week for various, various reasons. I mean, the, these family courts, they pick on people with learning difficulties. Just because you, you don't have the highest IQ doesn't mean that you can't love and care for a child. Absolutely doesn't. But it's like it's, it's picking off weaknesses. And when there aren't any weaknesses, they'll just make some up. And, and and you know, I I have an email account that I've had for for years and years when when the Charlotte case was going on. And, and I check it from time to time. And every single time I'll open that up, there'll be 30, 40, 50 emails of people asking for help. And it's overwhelming. You, you know, sometimes like you must get this as well. You can only hear so much bad news all the time. Sometimes you have to physically step back from that because it, it it's so overwhelming. No, it's a lot worse and, for and, you. And you. It's it, a lot worse for you, Sharon. I mean, I, 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 yeah, of course, not just this programme, but every programme, mainstream programmes, people sometimes think that you'll be able to help and you have to just be blunt but kind at the same time and say, well, I might have a phone number for you, but I, I can't really be, be of any help. It's much worse for you because you're going through it yourself. And, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah. I was getting poor people, you know, and, and there's a number of these people over the years um, that particularly with, with like the... It, I used to get people getting in touch with me all the time for shaken baby cases, and also um, the Munchausen by proxy, because what they tend to like to do is if you're a woman, you'll get done for Munchausen by proxy. If you're a man, it will be shaken baby syndrome. Um, it just seems to be a pattern that's forming. Um, but I mean, I, I've had people sending like where they don't know who you are, really, but your name's got out. I've had stuff turn up at my house, like court files with, with pathology pictures and reports and reports and reports. And this is how bad that system is. If people are that damn desperate, they will send their most personal documents to a complete stranger in the hope that some fucker out there will help them. This is a shocking state of affairs for a justice system, isn't it? It's horrendous. Because I'm, I'm not medically trained. It's I feel horrendous. like I am now, but 
um, but you, you know when when there literally is nowhere to go that you will send your you know your police interviews with where where it's all your secrets to a complete stranger and you just think something has got to be done here but it won't be you, you know what what can you do i can read these documents i can pick out faults um you, you know like this doesn't match this and what about this test result that's missing that's missing that's missing but this all adds up to what's in the news news at the moment isn't it the the cps withholding evidence withholding evidence yeah which yeah. is which is it, the most it, egregious crime that any justice system that any prosecuting department can do it's it's the worst thing they can do of course sharon you you've told us a, a story a lot of it is in the public domain in terms of um what happened to charlotte and the case and mark being acquitted horrendous for for you all to be put through that and um you know i'm not doing a bloke thing now but you know just acknowledging how difficult it must still be for your ex-husband mark and um of course for both of your extended families having that happen and all the lies and the collusion and the corruption and the obvious attempts to bury what happened to to charlotte but then the punitive you know taking take you take him what what we what we called earlier on retaliation against you because you asked questions because you had the temerity to get members of parliament and others to demand well, I mean, documents this, this is this is the thing Richie, because obviously on paper um my ex-husband is the baddie in this um the cps would the, the police involved in that case um would stand to this day and and, and I've, I've spoken to them over the years um and and they 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 say to this day he got away with it um that's what they say now the thing is he yeah he, but they know he didn't sharon they know he didn't on. do it He's gone on to get married. He's still he's got his business, and and from what I can make out, has managed to move on. He gets no trouble at all, and has had no trouble at all, because he's not. I don't know. To me, it comes across he's not interested in the documents from Parliament. He wasn't interested. He had no comment when I sent him a copy of this death certificate and that. Um, so it, can I make a done. suggestion there? And feel free to swear blindly at me I don't mind I'll take it but maybe and I've never met the man I'd like to speak to him to be honest at some stage in the future having heard everything that's happened but maybe maybe he was terrified Sharon afterwards you know maybe he was proper and that's a very difficult thing for a man to admit or to deal with maybe he was terrified having spent that time in prison having come so close to being convicted of murdering his daughter which he didn't do maybe just maybe he was terrified and maybe it's easy for me to say from the outside looking in maybe you could try i could not you or anybody i don't i don't expect i wouldn't put words in your mouth but maybe i could try to understand why he decided not to pursue it oh uh, no i i i mean i with regards to that i mean i i don't have malice with him with regards to we we were both in a situation and unfortunately, what you know, you don't go to prison on a charge like that and come out the same person. You don't have your wife on the outside running around the world looking for medical experts and yeah. fighting everyone that they can and think this is the same same person they were before it all happened. So we both drastically changed and those two people just didn't get along anymore because we'd been played off against each other um for many years you, you know, many years and and that 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 just couldn't be fixed and in retrospect he done absolutely the right thing because he moved on with his life and he's relatively happy now i know who isn't relatively happy now me <laughs> you know so he did do the right thing and i don't i don't blame him for that it was frustrating at the time because i wanted us to be on the same page because we always had been prior to that um, but it was like when that fight was over um, and the trial was finished, it had turned into the trial was the only thing that we had in common anymore. It the rest of the one. It destroyed so much, didn't it, what what, what happened? I, I, I just want to bring it back again to the, because we're coming to, you know, I don't, I don't want to say we're coming to the conclusion, but we're coming near enough to the end of, of our time. Um, 
I, I can tell you from the tweets that I'm looking at coming in and um, private messages I'm being sent is that what you've told us, it's stunned people. That's obviously no consolation to you whatsoever, nor should it be, but it has stunned people to hear what happened to you and then to hear that last August, presumably, again, you don't have to answer this, um, some trumped up future risk of emotional harm because of your vaccine stance that they took your your three year old daughter away from you it's 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 stunned me when you told me this and it's stunned our our listeners and they obviously want to know where do you go from here with that what can you do what what legal remit do you have from here with regards to your daughter um it's i i well none as 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 far as i can see um that doesn't mean that that i'm not going it is taken me years to get this far with the charlotte situation so it doesn't mean to say that i've even started um with with this process um the the you know, it, it's like having your life held to ransom because I have to tread so carefully because the slightest bit of upset and I'm in so well, <laughs> I'm in so much trouble, which could jeopardise anything later on. Um, do I think she's coming back? Not any time soon. Sorry. <laughs> and there's just you and your 21-year-old son. Sharon, you, how do I say this? Is there are there people around you? I mean, your son is a man, of course, he's twenty one. But are there people around you that that you can lean on? I mean, it, I can't imagine what you're going through. It does. I can't imagine it gets any worse for people. How how is there somebody there looking out for your well being? Um. Yeah. I mean, I've got I've got to friends and stuff like that. Um. But I'm uh, like standardly, I'm not the needy one, you know. I'm the one that helps everyone, um, and it's it's a lot easier to be the helper than than the you know the weak one kind of thing. But oof, been through, you know. It's it, it's it's going to be another shitty process, isn't it? Um, what to do with the Charlotte situation, don't know. What to do with this new piece of shit hell, um, I just don't know. I'm running out of options. I can go and have another MP rally, I suppose. I could do that. Um, maybe that would change it. Uh, maybe things have changed in the time that I haven't bothered with Parliament anymore. I doubt it. It's still be the same den of corrupt iniquity that it always has been. Um or do I just carry on doing what I'm doing and um, help as many people as I possibly can uh, with the limited <laughs> physical and emotional reserves that are left kind of thing? Um, because you can't... It's better to help than curl up in a ball, isn't it? And if I can't do anything for my little family at the moment, try and help somebody else's. You, because if, if things can get nipped in the bud early on, and this is the thing, if you can nip something in the bud very early on, the system doesn't have a chance to escalate it. Well, you said something very important earlier. And I think it's more than just sage advice. This might be vital advice. If you've listened to Sharon speaking, you might be catching this on the podcast or you might catch it on YouTube. If you and your husband or wife are about to have children and if you've got very strong opinions about the well-being of children concerning vaccines and you're of a mind that you wouldn't vaccinate and that you would resist all efforts to vaccinate your child you need to seriously consider leaving the country and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that I was reluctant to say that in the past I did say that if Caroline and myself were ever to have a child and we don't have children we'd love to have children because of our very definite opinions about vaccine when I say our I mean our I, I haven't 
inflicted my opinions on Caroline. Caroline's very strong, very independent, very like Sharon, in fact, in terms of her determination and her single-mindedness and her um, her individuality. She has her own opinions, and, and, and like us, she's got very strong opinions about vaccines. So if we were to get that news that Caroline is pregnant, we'd be out of here. We would. We, we, we'd, we'd just go, and we, we know pretty much where we'd go as well. And you're... You're endorsing that. If you've got these concerns about giving vaccines to your children and you're told you're going to have a baby, Sharon, you should get out. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not even, it's, I mean, it's not even parents that are not, it's anyone who's not towing the line. Um, people are being attacked by social services and they're homeschooling their children. These people, they're getting attacked. People with learning difficulties, they're getting attacked. People who don't vaccinate, they're getting attacked. And it basically is like you're on some computer system and if you haven't ticked all of those boxes that the state says you're supposed to have ticked in no matter what 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 element of that, you get a little black mark next to your name and in come the stormtroopers and and before you know it this thing has escalated out of out of control um and and this i i mean it's the same in new zealand i i i I, uh, there's a case of a lady who had three of her children taken away in the uk she went to new zealand um got married again put it all behind her had had two more children over there um somehow the uk authorities found out about these children now these children had been in, in the healthcare system in New Zealand, there'd been no problem with them at all, none whatsoever. UK social services get involved, she lost those two children. You, you know, it's like you cannot be on this radar, you know, you've got to tick all them boxes. So what is this? This is like, I don't want to vaccinate my child or I don't want to put them in the institution that's going to kill their mojo, which is the education system. Um, so I'm going to get hounded now for that for the for the for the rest of my days. Potentially, I'm going to have my children taken away. Um, so you've got to play Russian roulette with your children here to ensure that you're not on the radar for that to happen. You've got to go against things, uh, go against your fundamental beliefs of what is right and what is wrong for your own family. And and when we live in a society, well, society, there's nothing social or societal about it, is there? When when that is how how a country is run, you can't possibly have kids here because you've got to compromise every belief you've got. I'm genuinely sorry that um, you're talking to me. Now that's you know I've been around the block a long time. I've worked for organisations with enormous audiences, big commercial stations. So I'm not, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not fishing for compliments here or any of that garbage. We're aware of the limitations of the independent media. We might have a big audience, but it's an audience of people largely interested in the independent media. And it's a tragedy that you're not telling this story to BBC Radio Four or Panorama or Victoria Derbyshire or somebody like that. It's a, it's a disgrace that you're not telling that story, this story, this vital story to somebody like that because it's only through those avenues that you'll get quick change because of course if Panorama or Victoria Derbyshire or even Sue Reid at the Daily Mail or Christopher Booker at the Telegraph if they if they took the information you gave me which is sound and watertight by the way and ran stories well there would be there would be an outcry there would be an outcry that something like this could happen that a child could 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 become very seriously ill. And rather than try and help her or figure out what happened, people came together to cover it up and then punished her mum for asking serious questions about it. You know, this is a tyranny. It, it, it's a tyranny. It doesn't get any worse than what you're hearing now. And 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 it's and I don't think I mean I've never heard of um, a case the same as mine with all of these elements in one shit pie kind of thing um but it's certainly elements of this certainly aren't exclusive either this because this was the thing Richie when this all kicked off I had in my mind I have made mistakes at work 
anyone can make a mistake at work. So if you happen to be a medical expert or this or that or the other, like if it's an isolated incident, that this is just a horrible, horrible mistake. All they had to do to me was say sorry. That that was it. I know I wasn't going to sue the NHS and take more money out of it when it can't afford to look after the child that kept this charge in. Um, you're just making more potential children at risk by by suing the NHS. If someone had have held their hand up and gone, we monumentally fucked up, we are sorry, that would have been it. That would have been it. And I would have gone away quite cross, but at least someone had been held accountable for this. The complete reverse has happened. And 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 it's not exclusive to Charlotte's case. It isn't. This is there's people in prison. I know of a lady whose husband could have been out if he'd admitted what he'd done, could have been out ten years ago. This guy is very seriously ill now. He's been in prison seventeen years. He's as innocent as as my ex husband. He's as innocent. And and these are just cases that I know from back then when it was going on. Of course there's hundreds and hundreds more now. Hundreds more of people languishing in prison, doing extra years because they won't go to parole and admit what they that admit, yes, I did do this, and yes, I am very sorry, and yes, I've been here ten years. If if people done that, they'd be let out on parole. Um, these men and these women are not doing that. They won't admit that to get out. They'd rather die in prison. And what a terrible situation that is. They've got unbelievable courage. People can't imagine it. Sharon, look, I'll tell you what we'll do. The, o the only thing we can do is, is send the audio of our conversation to the people I mentioned and strongly recommend that they listen to what was said and then get in touch with you at the earliest opportunity to facilitate you showing them the information that you showed me. Um, I don't want to be criticising the people that I've mentioned. I wouldn't be overly optimistic that they want to get involved. No, I'm not either. But you know, I hope they, I hope they hear this and are shamed into getting involved. I hope they hear it and say, well, you know, well, maybe I will get involved. Um, well, over, over the period of time with this, Richie, I know you've got to wind up because I've taken up way too much. I know you haven't time. taken up way too much of your time at all. No, I'm, I'm just thinking about getting this um, online um, uh, as soon as we possibly can and start getting it out to people. Well, in, in the early said. days, um, like I, I spoke to a lot of journalists um, and stories were written. This was this was when it was all in the public domain kind of thing. So there was no reporting restrictions and stuff like that with the um, family court shit, which basically like glues your mouth up or you go to prison. Um, but we had, I'd got in touch with journalists. They were all very interested, genuine journalists as well. You know, um, I'm quite a good people reader. Um, genuinely quite shocked at what they were being told, um, which is half of it because obviously a lot of time has passed since then. Um, and they were like, this is just unbelievable. And da, 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 da. they were going to their editors. They won't let them publish these things. They, they were gutted. These people were gutted. You know, like they just won't run this story. The the editor will not run this story, and and I doubt. If, I, if anything, I would imagine media's got worse, not better. No, it's got worse. Yeah. Yeah. So no, yeah. no one hold their breath. <laughs> yeah, you have virtue signalers like James O'Brien on LBC and people like that. Ugh. Men of the people, lawyers, lawyers. You know, because it takes nothing to say. Well, do you know what? Fuck the bosses. Put that woman on line three. Get her on the program. Let's let 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 them take me off the air. I mean, how much money is enough? You get to a point. You're on a seven figure salary. You've got plenty of money. Fuck it. Let her on the air. Let her say what she wants to say. And if I have to pay the consequences, well, so be it. But when it comes down to it, sadly, these people are not journalists. They're they're just apologists for the system. Their system propers. They prop the system up, masquerading as journalists. You know, this is the biggest story, Sharon, that I will cover this year, last year or next year. What's happened to you, the information you, you sent me is profoundly shocking, deeply disturbing. Do you, know, do you know something else, Richie? It's like when, when you, you put the little caption thing that um, that you put up on, on the Facebook, on the Richie Allen page. Um, yeah. When I read that, um, I was like, blimey, it's like... 
um it's not that bad kind of thing in my head because this situation has sa- turned sadly fucking normal for me and it was only reading that and i'm thinking yeah but that is all true jesus but for me this is just another day this is normal it has sadly turned normal and and this has been i didn't expect to feel this way just by reading that and it's like yeah actually this is fucking horrific if i was reading this about somebody else i would be furious i would be shocked to my core so any of your listeners and that out there i really hope that this doesn't upset anybody because when you live with something i hope it does upset like, somebody what, what, what do you mean i i hope people are absolutely disgusted i hope people are disgusted to the point that they'll get in touch with their members of parliament or their mayors or local councillors and say enough's enough you, you know people should be upset by it you know they really should be you know i was horrified listening to this on thursday I was horrified listening to it tonight. I'll be horrified tonight thinking about it. And and who and who the hell am I, you know, to be to be horrified? You have to live with it. I can get up tomorrow morning, have breakfast and go and make another programme. You have to live with this. And people need to think like that. They need to think, oh, what a terrible story. Oh, I'll tag my friend in it. She'll love this story. Well, not love it, but she'll be, she'll be horrified. And then we'll all go and just fuck off and then forget about Sharon Gale. You see, we can't do that. You, you know, and, and that's what the media has become. One t- tragic story after another. One, uh, not like this, of course. The media won't cover stories like this, but they'll cover stories, you know, pathos filled stories. We, we can't do that. We can't. Oh, it wasn't that terrible, that woman. What was her name again? What do you mean, Martin? What do you mean, what was her name? Her name was Sharon Gale. She's had her child well, taken wrongfully. It, her daughter was it, murdered. It's, it's funny, like, you should say that, Richie, because I was speaking to someone um, the other day about this, and, and I said, do you know what? We're all animal lovers. We are. Um, But isn't it something that we've been so indoctrinated by all the violence on TV, everybody's killing everybody else, everybody's shooting everybody else, that actually we'd be more appalled about a cat being killed than a human being. Well, do you know what that's evidence of? That's, That's evidence of widespread psychopathy because that's a psychotic trait, that. Yeah, Some, and and but yeah. if could you imagine if you bought a yeah. movie out where basically it was it was an hour and a half film of animals being tortured and murdered, um, that wouldn't be considered entertainment. People would be absolutely appalled with that. Well, they'd march, um, but they'd it's okay to, to watch people getting blown to smithereens. <laughs> I remember, you know? remember many years ago. Anybody who's a fan of the Sopranos television show will remember when his psychiatrist Jennifer Melfi finally starts to see Tony Soprano for what he is, um, a psychopath, a, a monumental madman. And one of the traits of the psychopath is the psychopath is always overly concerned about the the plight of tiny animals and, and baby squirrels and stuff like this, but couldn't give a rat's arse about, you know, somebody living next door to them who's stone broke to the point that they can't feed themselves. Absolutely. You're absolutely right to make to make that point it's half um, nine as we chat we'll um, I don't know what to say Sharon you know saying, saying saying all the best with it and good luck I mean I'm going to be in touch with you anyway but saying good luck with it and you know it sounds it sounds like it sounds like a nonsense to say the best of luck with it what you've been going through for the best part of 18 years it's a nonsense for me to say you know good luck with it and you know chin up and all that bollocks you know I don't know what to say I'm going to give you the last word and then I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to close the microphones, stop the recording and um, and then I'm going to send it to some people I know in Fleet Street. Not giving too much hope that anything will happen out of that but I'm going to do that and I'll copy you in on those emails. And um, I think you're amazing. I'll give you the final word. Well, and, um, I I just like to thank you, Richie, for um, you know having having the balls to to actually look at look at this for me um, or with me, um, and let's let's see what happens. And I just I very much appreciate your program anyway. You know, I've been listening to it for years, probably since you first started, and and it, it's an important job that you do here because it. You, you you play it down that you're not the biggest platform and things like this, but it doesn't really matter. You are a platform 
for for stories like this to come out and every single one of these stories you have on your show could potentially affect every one of us you never see it coming but but all of these things when you have things about health things about politics it it's affecting us all on a daily basis and so don't you know you do yourself a disservice there sir and i just want to say thank you so very much for letting me go on this evening and um and and having having such kindness about you because it, it shines out of you it honestly does and it's it's been a privilege thank you no the honor is all mine i, I won't no, um, i won't be ringing you um this evening but um I, I i do um plan on if you're available giving you a shout tomorrow and we'll have a chat about um what we've talked about and, and we'll uh, and we'll have a chat about who we can send the audio to and if there's anything else that we can do um thanks for your time sharon and um yeah it's vital that people hear what what it is that you've gone through and said as difficult as it might be for you to talk about it because it could be coming soon to the front door of any one of those people listening to you and me tonight there's no doubt about that i'll speak to you tomorrow right okay take care thank you ever so much richie cheers sharon that was Sharon Gale live on the line from the south coast and that's the end of the programme um, I'm going to wrap it up now I won't be taking any music or anything I'm going to stop the recording and, um, and and get it online thanks for staying with us and when this becomes available on podcasts through Podomatic and iTunes and when you see it on YouTube please um, you know forget about sharing it on Facebook and Twitter physically play it for people you know sit down with people and say listen have a listen to what's going on with this lady and what's happened to her family because i won't ever cover anything as shockingly corrupt and as horrible as what is happening to sharon gale and what has happened to her and her daughter charlotte and her family so do that for me and um, we'll do this again tomorrow at seven o'clock that's uh uk time 7 p.m for uh, Wednesday's programme. Again, massive thanks to Sharon for coming on and talking about it. I can't imagine how difficult that was for her. Until tomorrow, look after yourselves and one another. It's bye for me. Bye for now. Bye.